Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to our first kickoff meeting. I'm Scott Chesney. I'm with Spokane County Planning. We are at the beginning of a process of updating the county's comprehensive plan. It has been since in a sense, since 2001, the county did its first plan under the Growth Management Act, which was passed by the legislature in the 90s. And that act was designed to help cities shape how they grow uh, and try to provide for what was called compact urban growth and to uh, use capital facilities wisely. Uh, the, the plan of the county has been updated every seven years or so until now. And now we're into a 10 year cycle. Uh, we will be updating this by June of 2026. Uh, so we we have some time before us, but as uh, many of you know, with complicated projects, that time may go very quickly. So we're uh, we're moving forward and getting our, our first chance to go on top with you and share with you what's going to be happening here. Yeah. Uh, we've got some slides for you to go through. Now, generally, what we're going to talk about today is uh, what is the plan, what does it do, how do you get involved, and what are some of the key elements that we will be looking at at the county in these next couple of years. And just kind of up front, when I say the county, we do have some responsibilities that are independent of our cities, but a huge part of this effort is in cooperation with all of the cities and towns in the county itself, because the county's comprehensive plan is seen by the state government as the regional plan, and the county is the regional uh, government for that plan. So, all of the city and town plans need to be in conformance with the county plan. Therefore, it's better for us to do that in partnership than to do it with them. Thank you. So uh, here's what we're going to try to accomplish today. Uh, you know, with a little bit of what we are, uh, what is the plan, and ending with you know, how can we be involved. Uh, here's our county. You can uh, Some of you probably know mo uh, most of this. Uh, 1,700 square miles, 13 incorporated cities and towns. Uh, the population now just about 540,000. Uh, and we're expecting uh, in 2046 that estimate to go up to 650 or more thousand. That is an estimate made by the State Office of Financial Management or OHM. Uh, they make these projections for all of the communities in the state, all of the counties and communities in the state based on uh, in migration, uh, natural selection, uh, and they make a high, a medium, and a low range over that 20 year period. The county and our corresponding municipalities have chose the middle ground as the, as the safest approach to, to plan for that. If, uh, if we grow faster than that, it's easier to accommodate that growth than it is if we overshoot and have to back off from that. We'll tell you a little bit why uh, as we go forward. Next, please. You can see some of the basic statistics here. Uh, the median home price, I'm sure, has all of our attention over these last five years or so, how that is totally shot up from where it has been before. Uh, and uh, that will, uh, again, in some of our future uh, slides, they will be talking specifically about housing and how that is an important part of our planning uh, to keep ourselves growing. And next, please. So the plan, as you can see, it's a it's a guide. Uh, it helps us market Spokane County to outside folks that want to come here, want to grow here, but come and build a business, uh, come and go to school, and do those things. Uh, it's also a guide to growth for those that are already here. Who, uh, while we have uh, really these four functions in our department, one is this comprehensive plan function, one is a planning and permitting function. Uh, the others building permits themselves and the third is, is code enforcement and those all work together because while we're planning for growth and encouraging growth at the upfront side our code compliance section is there to preserve and protect the growth that's already in place so we're, we're conscious of, of that whole continuum of growth uh, one key piece you could say it's not, it says it's not legislation another way of thinking of that is the comprehensive plan is a guide for growth but it is not law uh, the zoning code, the subdivision codes, the part of the Spokane County codes, those are the actual statutes and laws and rules that, that uh, regulate growth. The uh, comprehensive plan is a state function uh, overseen by the Department of Commerce. 
And you can see the map shows the different areas that have to complete this task at different years. We're on different cycles. Uh, that, that helps all of us. Uh, some of the early uh, planners, uh, namely the Puget Sound counties, we as the you know, one of the bigger, larger counties outside of that, uh, can learn from some of the things that they find in the world and, and then some of our other counties around us, uh, we will work with to, as they go into their 26, 27 aspects. So as we said, we're in the 26th cycle, which means our county board needs to act on this and we have teed it up on their calendar for Tuesday, June 30th, 2026. Yes, please. There's uh, 15 goals that are in the Growth Management Act uh, in the law. Uh, you can see the first eight here, they're, they're fairly straightforward, uh, you know, growth, sprawl, transportation, housing, economic development rights, and so on. Thanks, please. And then uh, they go into, uh, Things more direct, like public facilities, uh, it includes capital facilities up front. And then notably at the end, you can see, I'm sorry, uh, the second one, climate change and resiliency is a new element that the legislature enacted last year. Uh, that will be uh, something where we have to now look at growth in the focus of, uh, is it sustainable? Uh, is it resilient? And resiliency, especially for you know, those of you that may have been West and north of us last summer, uh, resiliency really comes home to roost when you talk about wildfires and wildland fires. This is a chance to do something more than just disaster mitigation planning. It's a chance to look forward at growth and say, how can we, how can we do some of this growth and minimize some of those risks from uh, climate and other issues? Right, uh, these are broken into both required and, and optional. Uh, chapters or elements that we could do there. And you can see we, we're adding um, several that are not necessarily in there by statute, uh, notably uh, things like uh, parks and recreation. Uh, while those are important, they're critically important for Spokane County. It's, it's, it's who we are, it's how we live. If we don't take uh, note of our environment and uh, our parks, our recreation, our open space, our trails, our critical areas, uh, we're, we're not doing our, our land, uh, Good job. Please. Here's how the plan all comes together. Uh, and if you uh, if, if you think this is a very straightforward job, uh, you can start to see the layers that come into play here from the plan and its elements, the middle, taking guidance from state law and the Growth Management Act, regional and local issues, and then dropping out of that all of the implementation parts of that, which include our development regs and our codes, as well as shoreline management, capital decisions, and things like that. The comprehensive plans for uh, the Growth Management Act and for Spokane County are comprehensive with a big C in that they are much more than just a landing plan. All of the county operations that deal with growth <clears throat> must be accomplished for and addressed in this comprehensive plan. And then they go into sort of implementation plans that go into public works. Uh, the growth that leads to roads then tells the public works department what those roads need to look like, how they need to serve, and how many parks do we need, things along those lines. We also work with what are called the special districts. Uh, and those are those are not mandated to be part of the Growth Management Act, but they're the ones that are you know, critical for our life in the rural areas, school districts, fire districts, and the water districts. So we mesh all of our work and the growth on our edges with those. Next, please. I'm going to uh, turn this over to Joshua uh, in a minute. Uh, before I do a couple other kind of things, we put up some boards on the sidebar uh, to talk about our, the comprehensive plan map, our aquifer recharge areas, our, our stormwater areas, and our urban growth areas. These maps are based on what exists today. Uh, these are the baselines for which we'll be looking at uh, analyzing the land use of the future. And that's what we'll be here uh, talking with you many times over these next two years. So our team is here to walk you through other parts of this. Uh, Josh was gonna start, Michael's with us, Vago is behind him, Ella is our producer and driving the ship. And I'll turn it over to Vago. Oh, Josh. All right. Thank you so much, Scott, for uh, that great introduction. Ella, could you go? So why does this plan necessarily matter to you? 
well, over the next two years, this is going to be your opportunity to tell us what your visions are, what your values are, how you see Spokane County developing over the next 20 year planning process. And I think what also is very um, important about this is that these policies will guide local development on the ground. It's going to affect not only the built environment, but also the natural environment. So we really welcome and we encourage getting as much community feedback as possible because you know it really does matter. Not only what the sun what goes on the ground, this will also affect different policy decisions. The policies and goals with a comprehensive plan will be used by elected officials to help guide legislation and make um, those decisions. And it also will be affecting current and future generations. These land use decisions and policies will not just be affecting us, but also the people in Spokane County in the future. So it's really important that we get as much input from you guys as possible. Because when you really think about it, it's your guys' plan. We're really just stewards of this plan. And the most successful comprehensive plans are the ones we have great public involvement. So right here we have our public participation roadmap. But not only is public participation important, under the Growth Management Act, public participation is required. We're required to have early and continuous public participation. And that's why we're starting this right now. We want to start you guys off early in this process. We can get feedback from you, but also include you throughout this whole time. Now, what we recently have been working on has been the public participation program. This was created for the comprehensive plan. The public participation program essentially is a framework which helps explain to you guys how we're going to be doing public participation over the next two years. It's essentially a roadmap for public participation. This shows different engagement strategies, information technologies. It shows a schedule of our um, scope of work. It also explains, you know, just our goals for reaching out to the public. Recently, because this past year, we been recommended by the Planning Commission. And we have this on our website in which you can look and see different ways in which you will be involved in this process. I think one of the most important ways in which you can be involved is to uh, join our stakeholder list. On our website, you can send us an email and we will also give you a QR code which and a website name. You can go up and sign up to be a stakeholder so you can really be involved in this process. Each GMA element and each GMA chapter will be having public forums in which you can attend. This is a great opportunity for staff to be sharing with the public what they've been working on and to get comments and feedback and to really have a collaborative approach. You know, as planners, we just don't want to stay in the office being by ourselves, not seeking public input. We want to make sure that we're including the public throughout the whole process. Again, it goes back to early and continuous public participation. And on our website, if you want the most up-to-date information on public forums and how you can be involved, we have our email sign up, which we'll be sending you guys emails and notifications on this. Throughout this public participation roadmap, we really see what we really see um, our website as the online hub for information. We are living in a digital age and we really want to make sure that we utilize that to help reach the most amount of people possible. On our website, you'll be able to see drafts for the plans. You'll also be able to submit comments on plans, get more information about comprehensive planning and a schedule of events. We're also doing during this process it's a really uh, unique uh, engagement form. We're calling them community consultations. They're not quite up yet, but in the future, you'll be able to schedule some time to go over and talk to a planner about your concerns and have us explain to you um, the different aspects of comprehensive planning. We would also like to do uh, a great social media outreach to you guys. So ensuring that we're not just notifying you on the website, but different um, social media platforms as well. This is gonna be a very important process and we really look forward to having you join us during this time.
things different. And then next, we're going to get into our different specific elements. And we're going to start with the land use element with John Bill Thomas. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, I just got an introduction, so I'll spare you. But um, yeah, uh, let's just go on. Oh, actually, I should say um, most of the elements are being tackled by one or two specific people. Land use is unique for reasons I'll discuss. And so it's being tackled by the whole team, and, as well as two of our colleagues who are unfortunately not uh, here today. So yeah, the main purpose of land use is essentially the phrase I'm looking for. It is basically saying what land can and cannot be used for, um, for promoting orderly development. In, you know, we're trying to create orderly, efficient development. Um, yeah. So in terms of the human plan goal for doing that urban growth and the reduction of the sprawl. And our main land use categories are going to be residential, commercial, industrial, mixed use, and resource lands. And those get broken down a little bit as um, there are subcategories of those, but for, for our purposes, those are the those are the broad categories. Yeah. And in terms of the importance of land use, this is one of the the phrase that I want. This is one of the most overarching elements, and there are several different reasons why it's so important. It minimizes conflicts between different land uses, you know. You have an industrial area over here and you have schools over here, you know, having them next to each other is going to create issues. So we space them out to minimize that. Um, safe transportation, as I mentioned, the reduction of sprawl, protecting critical areas, open space, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and then I'm gonna jump right into housing. So I'm on this one as well as um, my colleague Tate Andre, who's working to sit today. So the, the main purpose of the housing element is to ensure that we have enough housing, enough affordable housing for Spokane County residents through our planning horizon, which in our case is 2046. Um, so we're going to be looking at you know housing types and housing types and densities, having the proper supply of affordable housing, where the housing is located, making sure people can access employment, transit, et cetera. <coughs> And then for the planning goal, we're looking at reduction of small housing for occupation. Um, we're going to go over these in a bunch, so I won't, I won't get into that. Yeah, and so this housing element is going to be the most thorough one that has ever been developed for Spokane County. Uh, and this is just owing to a host of new state laws that have come into effect. This is just a couple of them. Um, we're going to be looking at stronger language on providing affordable housing for all income segments. I can break that down a little bit more, but basically just extremely low income, low income, moderate, etc. Um, we're doing an inventory of racially discriminatory policies and practices, as well as ways we can we can mitigate that and um, undo the harms that have been done there. You know, providing for missing middle housing, etc. This is just kind of a nutshell of it, but it's uh, as I said, it's going to be the most thorough housing. Element. And so a lot goes into this element, um, too much to put on one slide, but we are going to have our population projections in our, our data that we're pulling from uh, the land capacity analysis, which unfortunately my colleague who's on that is not here to speak to it today, but um, public outreach such as this, interagency coordination, Spokane Housing Authority, our colleagues in housing and community development, et cetera, et cetera, as well as our own um, internal and external data analyses of these and Billy and other points I want for you with. Yeah, and then I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Joshua to talk about transportation. Thank you so much, Father, for that. I'm right here. Um, I'm Joshua again. And uh, I'll be doing the transportation element with uh, Tate Andre. And this will also be done in coordination with the Public Works Department. So essentially the purpose of the transportation element is to make sure that the county has the proper financing and capacity and infrastructure to meet our future growth projections that we've been talking about. It also ensures that our transportation network is consistent with and can supply our future land use map. The transportation element provides a 20 year vision for Spokane County's transportation network. 
This includes our different infrastructure and financing options. I think that it's really important to demonstrate that the transportation element and the land use element are interconnected. The transportation element must ensure that we can fulfill and properly finance and has the capacity to meet our land use element without going against our level of service standards. Slide. So transportation meets three growth, uh, meets three planning goals under the Washington State Growth Management. The first one is urban growth areas. We need to make sure that our transportation network can, can properly meet our urban growth areas without compromising our level of service standards. Now, the transportation is recently updated based off of House Bill 1181. That is the Climate and Resiliency House Bill. Essentially, now we need to be preparing for multi-model level of service standards, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions. We also have to make sure that we're reducing vehicle miles traveled per capita. And this is done at a regional scale. And again, this has that collaboration between us as the regional, uh, regional county and with the different cities. And this is done by our local MPO, the Spokane Regional SRTC. And also the next planning goal that this meets is our public facilities and services. At the time of development, we need to make sure that before occupancy, that adequate transportation in our road, net, road networks are up to stuff and will not compromise our level of service standards. Slide. And this is really a roadmap showing how the transportation element is actually implemented. We start at the comprehensive plan levels which we take your community vision and your values into goals and policies, which is then implemented into our capital facilities plan, which shows an inventory of our capital facilities and our financing options, which goes into the transportation element of itself, which demonstrates how will we pay for this transportation corridors and networks and how this infrastructure will be done. This is further fulfilled by the transportation improvement plan. This is a list of capital projects and financing options that the county will do to meet these goals. And then even beyond that, we have our much more broad 20-year financing plan, which shows how we plan to finance these projects. And the final project that we have is that we're having a efficient transportation network that is paid for and is able to serve the county. Next slide. Next, we have the natural environment. This chapter is being done by myself and my colleague, Tate Andre. Next slide. So the natural environment is going to encompass three general ideas. It's the classification of our natural resource lands, our critical areas, and our open space. Now these meet three very important GDMA planning goals. We need to preserve and protect our natural resource lands, but that also includes, while using that, but also doing it in a sustainable way that we can use it for today's generations, but also future generations as well. Our natural resource lands are a great cultural resource for Spokane County. It's one of our unique identities. And it's something that we need to make sure that we can protect. And this also includes our open space and our recreation. Use preserving open space to help preserve wildlife and fish, but also allow it to be open to the public for trails and recreation. And lastly, protecting the natural environment. This is our protecting our air and our water quality. So this chapter is usually a tool that we use to help protect and preserve and enhance these natural areas. So once again, I would like to start with the natural resource slide. Natural resources under the Washington State Growth Management Act are considered your forest lands, your agricultural lands, but also your mineral lands. Again, these hold very important economic, but also cultural significance to Spokane County. And I think something that's really important that we need to know is it's very important to protect and preserve these areas 
because once we lose them, it's very difficult to get these back. They're usually gone forever once they're developed. So that's something that we are taking very serious during these updates. Next. The next thing that we get to protect is our critical areas. Critical areas consider our wetlands, our critical aquifer, wheat charge areas, but also geological hazard areas and frequently flooded areas. Now, this is done for two reasons. One, it helps prevent these areas which have important ecological function to our county, but also helps protect our population and land use owners from potentially hazardous materials when they're doing their development. And this would be implemented in our critical areas ordinance, which we have one year after 2026 to update. Next slide. And also we have the importance of open space. This would be done by connecting uh, fish and wildlife habitat areas, biologically diverse areas, and different wildlife corridors. This is valued because it helps protect Spokane County's unique wildlife, our trails, and recreation, which I know is very important to the members of this community, something that we'll take very serious during this plan. But also connecting our critical areas and our green belts. Again, we want to preserve our open space make sure that we are allowing our specific and ecologically important um, our wildlife to be able to be preserved and to stay here and not have any loss of ecological function. <laughs> Next is rural lands, which is also being done by Tate Andre and myself. And the GMA, the GMA has a very specific way in which they categorize rural lands. Rural lands in the GMA are lands that are outside of our urban growth areas, but are not being done for natural resources. They're not being done for urban growth. So this is different than our urban growth areas, which are done in more urban densities. We have our rural lands, which are done at lower densities, higher lot sizes. And these are really influenced by rural values, rural lifestyles, and rural character. In our rural areas, we understand that living in these areas is going to be a little bit different way of lifestyle than living in our urban areas, and it's reflected by them. Now, I think what we really need to understand is that our rural areas are essentially connected and interconnected to our natural environment. Our rural lands are used to preserve open space, protect the natural environment in critical areas, and we have different techniques that we use in our zoning code, such as rural clustering, which really helps uh, preserve those lands. Next Again, rural lands helps meet very specific GMA planning goals. Again, urban growth, separating our urban growth areas and our rural areas by different lot sizes and densities and understanding the differences between that Again, it's done by reducing sprawl. And the next two is again, it's our natural resources and environment. We have a real good opportunity to make sure that our rural lands are used to protect our natural environment, ecological functions, open space, and our natural resource lands. Next item. And the overall what you get from this, from our rural lands, is you can preserve you can preserve their lands, but also protect our ecological functions, reducing an appropriate conversion of undeveloped lands, but also uh, preserve our rural vision and promote sustainability and work towards creating rural economies, you know, bringing jobs to rural areas and bringing industries to rural areas as well. So that would be completing the rural element and next. I would like to bring it up to the next planner, which would be Michael Weir. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Weir. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for making it out here today and uh, learning a little bit about the comprehensive plan process with us. So you might be wondering, what are capital facilities? Uh, capital facilities are really the things that build our environment and the things we interact with every day. A lot of the uh, services that we uh, love to enjoy. Uh, it includes streets and sidewalks, traffic signals, a lot of that road infrastructure, uh, stormwater, sewer, parks and recreation, schools, uh, fire districts, the law enforcement, 
Uh, and these can be not only publicly owned, but they can also be privately owned and also special districts. So a lot of the water districts here in Spokane are special districts, not uh, necessarily owned by the county. Uh, the city is one of those that actually owns water. Um, so what are the planning goals for capital facilities? So the first one is urban growth, and that's really all about uh, encouraging that development to occur where the facilities are already available, because that's really just the most efficient way uh, to go about providing those capital, those capital facilities and uh, designating the growth where the facilities are already available. So we want to completely build out for new facilities to serve small populations. The other one is uh, ensuring that they're provided adequately. So that is making sure that they're provided at the time of development and that uh, we can maintain the levels of service that we've established so that they don't fall below those minimum level of service standards that we have. So how does this all kind of play out? It can get, kind of get a little confusing because there's a lot of uh, different moving parts in, in capital facilities and how we invest in those. So the first one is the comprehensive plan, and that really sets uh, the vision that we have for capital facilities and how they serve you in public. Uh, and that also sets out the framework of that intended growth. So we have to look at where we have established that growth to occur. We need to ensure that the public facilities are going to be there to serve the people. That plays into the capital facilities plan, which is a separate plan, but it is associated with the comprehensive plan because they, they kind of go hand in hand. And it really is a summarized version of how we're going to uh, fulfill making those capital facilities and maintaining them. So the first one is an implementation tool to the comp plan. So as we look at the comprehensive plan where we want to grow, the capital facilities plan will address what is needed uh, to serve the public in those areas. The levels of service is an established measurement that we use to ensure that we're providing it adequately to the public. So an example might be um, police officers per 1,000 residents is a, is, is a measurement. Um, another one could be square footage of educational space for students based on a certain amount for that population. So it really influences those capital investment decisions and growth patterns because they kind of go hand in hand and, uh, as our leadership looks at these growth patterns, they have to look at the capital facilities plan and say, okay, we know we needed to provide these capital facilities to serve this population. So it really will follow that growth. Um, a few of the GMA requirements for that plan is the inventory providing location and capacity. So we do an inventory at the beginning of this process to look at where we currently at with inventory. Uh, it really is a good measurement for what we can take on. The forecast of future needs, so that is, we do an analysis of uh, looking at the future forecast based on that population growth of what we're going to need, and we work with the other departments to highlight those needs of those areas we're intending to grow. Uh, the proposed location and capacity of new and expanded facilities. So as we have these investment projects, we're gonna look at, okay, how much is that really gonna increase our capacity? If we build a whole other school or the fire district gets another fire truck, are they able to serve the community and maintain those adequate levels of service that we're establishing? The six year finance plan, really important. How are we gonna pay for it? So you, you have to prove that you're going to be able to provide these and finance these projects. Otherwise, can you actually grow into those areas if you can't provide the road infrastructure, the, the sewer, the, the water? Uh, and then GMA also requires a reassessment. So if the problem funding falls short of meeting our expectations, we have to do a reassessment of those areas. So maybe a grant fell through where the, the funding was pulled. We would need to then go back to that area and say, okay, do we need to um, shrink the zoning or take away uh, that density in that area so that we can serve that area. Another method is lowering that level of service standard. So you might be lowering uh, water flow, uh, to, but still within a certain measurement. Uh, that's hopefully not what you would uh, your first alternative. And then how is this all implemented? So each department kind of has their own plan, but it's based off that CFP and that comprehensive plan. So it's kind of a trickle down. And those department of facility plans kind of focus um, on their own analysis that they've done provided by our comprehensive plan and capital facilities plan and highlight those big projects that are going to be needed and really 
tell the story of how they're going to get it done. The capital improvement program, the CIP, is how are we going to pay for those projects or what gets selected? So every year, uh, the Board of County Commissioners will look at the CIP and they select these projects and how they're going to invest in these infrastructure projects to, to maintain that level of service. Another uh, the development requirements is more of a day-to-day -day operation that we do. Uh, so it's a uh, concurrency requirements. So it might be a developer wanting to uh, build out a certain area. We may have that developer build out the sewer uh, or provide a, a park. Uh, so the result of all of this, when it is put out and works good, is you, you're provided with the adequate facilities and services that we've established and we maintain those levels of service. So parks and recreation, uh, this is another really important topic, uh, open space and recreation. The main goal of the GMA is uh, that open space, enhance their recreation opportunities, enhance fish and wildlife habitat, uh, and really increasing the natural resource and protecting them as well. And then building out on that and representing what the public wants and maintaining that level of service. So implementation and consistency with the capital facilities plan is a requirement, a 10 year parks and recreation demand estimate uh, the evaluation of facilities and service needs, evaluation of tree canopy coverage within the urban growth area, that's a new one, and then identifying intergovernmental coordination opportunities. That might be partnering with another jurisdiction nearby to meet that level of service requirements that may partner on uh, buying the lands to build a park and serve that community in that area. So it's very similar to the transportation element and uh, ties into the whole capital facilities element as well. So that comprehensive plan is where we're going to set those general goals and policies of parks and recreation. So we're going to grab your vision, what you want to see for parks and recreation, and we're going to put that in the comprehensive plan. The trickle down with the capital facilities plan will look at those level of service standards that we establish. We do an analysis, ensure that we're meeting that. And then the parks department actually makes their own parks plan with reference to the capital facilities plan and that comprehensive plan. And that really gets down to the nitty gritty fine details of how are we going to accomplish this? How are we going to serve the public? Uh, so they do a demands and needs analysis. They define those goals and objectives even further and how they're going to meet them. They do park projects and establish those. Uh, they provide a detailed park inventory. So they go even a step further than the capital facilities plan might in the inventory. And they might look at a number of baseball fields and uh, other recreational activities. Uh, and then they identify those funding sources of how they're going to pay for it. It's very important. You got to establish how you're going to pay for these projects before you can say, well, we're going to grow out here. Uh, you know, the money's not there. It ain't going to happen. Uh, so capital improvement plan, that CIP again, this is where the parks are going to be built out. It's where you're going to see the projects happen. And so those happen uh, at the end of every year. And uh, as those parks are selected, they'll get built out and funded and and then I will go ahead and pass this on to back to Scott for economic development. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'm, I'm pinch hitting today for part of our, our staff. <clears throat> Most people are concerned about economic development, it's how we grow our economy, it's how we that provide quality of life. That's how we provide goods and services. And so what we what we do in the economic development element is going to be a little different from what's been done in the past. Many of you probably know uh, the group Greater Spokane Incorporated as our Chamber of Commerce and Area Development Organization. Their job is economic development on a small scale and a large scale. Uh, the counties and the cities tend to play a smaller role in that. <laughs> But GSI tends to be focused on bigger projects. And one of the things that we need to do in our economic development program, next slide, is make sure we're uh, creating the right uh, regulatory systems, the right uh, incentive systems to bring people into the RV, into the county, and, and provide this as a good place to invest. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Economic development competes with areas all over. So one of the challenges we've got is to look at uh, what are the assets that we have here? Uh, in, in past work, uh, I've used something that we call place-based assets. What do we have that's here that we can build an economic model around that might be something different 
than another county or another place. If we could identify those opportunities, that gives us a, a leg up on, on going after businesses and things that fit them. So we're going to create a strategy that, that fits uh, all of our normal goals, but takes a little bit different perspective beyond that what, a, what a, an area development organization might do. And I'm gonna continue on with this one. This is a new requirement from the Growth Management Act. Uh, it is looking at two different things. One is the greenhouse gas emissions, and the other is this kind of resiliency. Uh, we're looking at doing this in a, a also kind of a unique way. Uh, Spokane County has offered, and uh, most of the smaller cities and towns have agreed to participate in this as a team. Uh, so we are pooling our resources uh, and being able to, to work with all of our, uh, essentially all, everybody outside of the Metro core area that will be working under the county umbrella to work on these things. We think that's important for one obvious thing, uh, greenhouse gases, gather gases, climate resiliency, uh, reduced vehicle miles traveled is not something that stops at the municipal boundary very well. And the smaller cities, uh, they are generally not equipped with professional staff uh, and it's expensive for them to hire consultants separately. So we think we could be a good partner by bringing them into the umbrella. Next case. <clears throat> this is going to be a new task for everybody in the state. Uh, we're going to have to look at, at where these things are going uh, and how uh, how they can how they're going to affect Spokane County. Uh, again, going back to the, you know, the gray and the health fires. Uh, yeah, we've never seen anything about that around here. Is there part of our planning that could help anticipate that or make us more resilient when those things are happening. So those will be kind of some interesting things that we should be looking at next week. And then uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled. This is a challenge uh, for pretty much every county east of the Cascade Bridge. Uh, we don't have a, a, a train system like the Puget Sound counties. We don't have a light rail system. We don't have an inner city bus system. Uh, and so we exist to a large degree in our vehicles. Uh, to the degree uh, that uh, Spokane Transit Authority can expand its system within the Metro core and in, in us working with them to help broaden their service out into the urban growth area or in an incorporated county. We can start to address some of this, but it will be sort of a challenge to do this in a very traditional way. One of the ideas that we're pursuing is the, again, the smaller towns uh, that have to make frequent trips into the metro area. Uh, you know, if you're out at Four Lakes and you've got to drive to Rose Hours downtown to get belt, that's kind of a silly thing to do. If we could find ways of providing more services and amenities in and near our smaller areas, we can, in our belief, we can help their quality of life as well as reduce some of those miles traveled on the highway. So this is going to be a really wide open uh, element for us to be studying. Now that said, uh, we also will, will be looking at this from a scientific perspective. We will be measuring greenhouse gases. We've got a state partners to do that. We will be looking at, at the chemistry and the air quality and things around Spokane County. And so at the end of this, we'll have a pretty good roadmap for you know, everybody here to say, here's, <clears throat> here's where we are, and here's how we compare to other areas. And maybe here are some ideas that we can still pursue that keep or enhance our quality of life, but then reduce some of these environmental issues. Thanks. Uh, you, can, you can see some of the uh, challenges with the, even the heat map in terms of uh, urban heat islands and things like that. This is this is something that we've all sort of experienced in various places. Uh, those of us that have lived in other areas, uh, in the South particularly, Phoenix, or Florida, or Texas, uh, have known how the climate has, has changed over you know, our lifetimes in those areas. And so it's, it's a measure of balancing how we grow with that quality of life. We think Spokane County has a huge sweet spot in this work. We're not too hot, we're not too cold, uh, we're not too windy, we're outside of a tornado zone, we're sort of away from the earthquake zone. Um, so we've got a lot going for us here that I think gives us a lot of flexibility with attacking this element. Thanks. Uh, and 
Here you can see the results. These are the reports that'll come up uh, in our plan. So where are we? Uh, <clears throat> we are in the second quarter uh, of 24. We're beginning this public participation. Uh, we will be working through all of that in the in the uh, year in at least a, a multi-part track. One part is this public participation group where, uh, as we've noted before, Joshua, uh, there will be stakeholders. There will be uh, climate advisory teams or housing advisory teams being put together with people that want to spend more time involved in those discussions. We will facilitate those. And then at the other time, uh, the technical planning staff will be working on all of those interconnected elements that, that Michael alluded to in capital facilities and, and parks and other things. Uh, we have what's called the Planning Technical Advisory Committee, which consists of planning, the professional planning staff of all of the communities in the county. And that meets once a month to go over this on a countywide level and individual level. So we have a huge collaborative advantage over a lot of places that we all talk to each other. We, we, we know what's going on next door and we're trying to be complimentary in making that happen. So that, that will happen through this year and next year. And in that time, we'll be rolling out some interim reports. And then we would expect to have something that resembles a final draft toward the end of 25. And then as we wrap into 2026, we'll be taking, in a sense, taking that final draft out for a test drive. Uh, you know, did, did we meet your expectations? Did we meet state expectations, regulatory expectations? And then with any luck at all, uh, we will be in the commissioner's hearing room on the 30th of June to uh, make that affirmation. The other group, by the way, that's, that's deeply involved in this is our planning commission. Uh, they are really the tip of the spear. They will be holding the public hearings on this. Uh, they will be the place where you will have the best chance for formal public input at those hearings that's recorded and, and put into our, our documents. Uh, and then uh, their recommendations along the line will go to their board of <laughs> Technology sometimes gets the best of us. That's supposed to be a QR code. <laughs> so, uh, in, in, in the meantime, we'll also make sure that uh, you can get to uh, us through our website, which, uh, if you aren't familiar, is the county's website and the building and planning sort of section or spokanecounty.org slash bp. That'll take you right to our site. There's a comp plan button on that where you can get information. You can leave us your name uh, and you can say, I want to know more about these things and sign up. Uh, this group will be contacting you from those specific elements if you have those uh, interests uh, and we'll be uh, working as we go forward. Uh, we have, we're going to be doing this similar uh, session in six other places. Uh, over the next uh, four or five weeks. And then we'll start wrapping into some of the more direct element sessions and uh, as we said, land use, housing, transportation, those that may be specific interests to some of you. Uh, and that work will start wrapping up here in the next uh, 30 days or so. So with that, we would love to take any questions or comments that you may have today. And thanks for thanks for attending. Yes. I have I have two. One is when you talk about the parks plan, is there public outreach going to be simultaneous with what you're doing here with the comprehensive plan of state here? That's for the girl. Yes, we will be coordinating that as best we can. Uh, they have some specific things they want to talk about, some specific parks, for example, how you program a park that, that is downstream of what we want to do. But as we talk to them, it's more of uh, uh, how do these parks connect? And they were talking about parks, and we put a trails layer on top of that, and we put a, an environmental corridor layer on top of that to make these things happen. So uh, we will have those uh, conversations uh, simultaneously to the best of our ability. So if we're signed up for this, then we would know what the parks plan activity related to park activity. Um, would. I would advise you to be safe to also connect with the parks department. We will we will pass that information along as we are convening meetings that involve the parks. But if they're doing something for a specific facility or a specific area, then our lists won't necessarily overlap. My other question is, 
Uh, the siting of solar and wind, will that be in the industrial area or what's your thinking about that? That's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> right now, the county, uh, Spokane County is code does not have really any direction for industrial scale energy, renewable energy, wind or solar. We are looking at uh, an interim ordinance that might give the county a chance to participate in those discussions at the state level and with uh, energy companies that we, uh, we have met with several. We know they're talking to landowners. We know they're going so far as to sign preliminary leases for land on wind and things like that. So the county needs to get into the game. Uh, we would expect to be bringing some of that ordinance uh, to our planning commission in the next 30 days or so, and then have a discussion with our county boards. That's more of a, I don't want to say emergency, but that's a short-term project. In the longer-term comprehensive plan, this, this climate and energy and resilience uh, will take into account industrial scale energy. One of the challenges we see, and on uh, that second map are, are our resource areas back there, the large tract eggs, small tract eggs, forest areas. We need to protect those egg areas uh, from being covered up by solar panels as much as we want renewable energy. We have to balance those land uses uh, to do that. And right now we don't have the tools to do that. So we're we're studying that and then we're be having that set of discussions and hearings to do, like I said, the next 30, 60 back days. Yes, sir. Are you targeting any specific areas uh, that are more appealing to expand like west, south, north, or is it going to be some kind of implementation where the whole circle gets bigger? Uh, there's no targeting yet. Uh, the last map over here shows our existing urban growth areas and the urban reserve areas, which is where our predecessors 20 years ago thought we would be growing after after 2021. However, we are studying those. Uh, one of the slides you saw earlier had something called the land capacity analysis. That's something that we are doing at the county and all of the cities are doing. What it is, is look based on, on that urban growth area and 20 years of growth, what do we have left for developable land? Once we know that, and then we have this population forecast, we can balance the two and say, we don't have enough land, we've got 100,000 more people, so we're gonna have to grow. That's when the shaping of the land starts to take place. It will be based on capital facilities, it will be based on uh, pieces that are there. Uh, and so it, it's not necessarily, it's likely that most of the growth will be in the Metro core, but Medical Lake, Cheney, uh, Deer Park all want to grow, and so we're working with them to grow into their own urban growth areas as well. But there's no target areas or there's no study areas yet. Uh, those will start to become known probably in the last quarter of this year. And some of that probably based on existing infrastructure, sewer, water. Uh, significant part. Yes, ma'am. Would you be keeping Website and things that are going back to the yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. You said it was dot slash Oh, slash BP for building and planning. Thank you. Yes. I'm a graduate of 30 years of election process, 1990 early Obama. For 30 years, we've ignored all the orchards in the landlord, Jason delivered the the most served area and the least developed. Is there some specific interest in that area? Uh, we yeah. have we have no specific interest per se, and we have not heard of any specific interest from outside sources. We will be studying that this this go around of the comprehensive plan is going to start almost with a clean sheet of paper. We're going to be studying every part of the county for the first time since two thousand one. So if there are interests or concerns from you and your neighbors in Otis Orchards, uh, we'll, we would love to hear about them. Yeah, there's, there's some urban growth area in, in, in proximity to that, especially just on north of the river uh, from Liberty Lake, that's in the urban reserve area. But again, we've, there's, there's been no specific target or interest. Is that universal to do what? When you say no specific target, is there no target, let's say, in the north end or 
council. That's correct. We have we have received letters of interest from a number of landowners to say we would like to be considered for inclusion in the urban growth area. We can't accept applications for that because of the way the process works and the state law doesn't allow that. But we, we do have those along with the urban reserve areas. Uh, those will serve as starting points if we have the need to expand that, that urban area. So you expect to live with people? No, we don't at all. We will be studying them independently. But since we can't take an application, what we simply said is send us a letter that your property is interested in ready and we'll put it in our file. Direct it to? Who will go to it? Yeah. Who, who will I direct it to? Oh, to, to, to me, to Scott, that the planning department. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, so how does the city council's decisions affect um, your office? For example, this week, um, the city council approved the moratorium for the top valley and stopping development for the next year. How does that affect your plans in your office? Uh, not really very much at this point. It doesn't slow down. In fact, it increases the need for good planning in that area. And along with our counterparts at the city, We've agreed to a, a, a joint planning process for that area from 195 to I-90 in that entire West Plains corridor. Uh, that's something that we'll be more at more formalizing as we go forward. But we intend to uh, look at the potential land use out there and plan that together. Uh, the one of the potential funding sources for that has been discussed comes from kind of a joint relationship between the county commissioners and the city. Uh, but we we think there's a uh, well, in the planning side, there's there's no reason to slow that down. The implementation, yes, the city's put a hold on that for a year. Uh, that could put more pressure on development wanting to push into the unincorporated county, uh, but we'll, we'll just have to wait and see how that happens. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, 1990, we bought 28 acres by the Meade Airport. It was UR 3.5. And growth management came in, and my wife and I weren't really paying attention to the process, but all of a sudden, administratively, it was outside the growth area, and now is urban reserve. Okay. With that said, the process that determined that was purely administrative. And so my question today is, I'm in the green zone, I'm in the urban reserve, I haven't sent a letter yet, but what I want to know is, are these planners over here going to be fair? Are they going to need any input for me as a stakeholder? Or do I wait and just see what happens? One of the, well, first off, uh, not, not to avoid the question, none of our team was here when GMA started. And those those rezonings happened because this, typically because the state forced the county and, and the cities to do them. So that, that's how the zoning happens. The reason we have a public participation program and the reason we're trying to create this, this very robust approach is so that unlike a land use action where something's gonna happen on a neighboring property, you get notified, people with 400 feet or a quarter of a mile around, you get notified that here's the project, here's the public hearing, come and tell us what you think. That doesn't happen on a broad comprehensive plan. Sort of the obvious reason we can't notify 550,000 people every time a decision is made. However, if we have this approach to public participation mm -hmm. where we're having these forums from time to time, working online and letting interested parties know, then anything that happens that's, uh, that uh, could affect the project or could affect the area around you, you'll have access to upfront because it'll be readily available. It won't be all the way to the end. It's like, here, what do you think? You'll, be, you'll, you'll have a chance, everybody will have a chance to see what's happening at every session with the stretch of it. Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to add was, you know, the term rural was explained as, it doesn't fit my property. I have 40 mobile home neighbors, an airport, and a residential development. That's on three sides. North 40 is building 400 feet away next year. And I think the land was never farmed. It's basically gophers, noxious weeds, and pine cones. 
and I've maintained it very well for 34 years. And I'm just asking or finding out what's the best way to get some consideration like all my neighbors have had. So what do you think there? Uh, well, first off, uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Minnesota, so Gophers are a friend of mine. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess what I would say is, is to, to stay in touch with us, keep paying attention to our, our website because we're going to we're going to turn our web into an interactive tool. Right now, it's it's a library. You can go there, you can see documents, you can leave us a note. We're going to turn that into essentially a twenty four hour public forum where people can come in whatever time of day they want. They can, and there'll be videos. You, you'll be able to see things like this. And be able to ask those questions very specifically, and then one of the team will be able to get back to you individually as well as through these potential forms. Thank you. Here and then there. Okay. Uh, like this gentleman, we, we've got some urban reserve and also up on South Hill. And we were under the assumption last year that because the absorption amounts were net inside the boundaries. We should apply with our land and we did and so are those getting consideration when their team goes to work that hey we have these applications on reserve and reserve lands and and then how do we get input to that unless you file our applications right uh you're, you're you're in the mix for two reasons one if you send a letter in it's in our file but more importantly you're already in the urban reserve area mm -hmm. those are going to be the first study areas that we will look at if the population projections show that we have to grow the urban growth areas uh, we're not at that point yet uh, and the urban growth area is not just the ugas that are around the metro core but are around Chile and that LA and Germany heights and deer park uh, there's hundreds and thousands of acres that were put into those UGA areas in the 90s when GMA was born, and they were left rural because, to best guess, nobody knew what they would be developing as. Those all have to be accounted for in this next cycle. And so the idea that if we're going to grow the UGA, it might be moving areas around rather than creating new areas. But still, if they'll they'll likely go to urban reserve areas first, because that's where the infrastructure is, that's where we were planning to grow, our predecessors thought we were going to grow. So at the moment, you don't need to do anything except kind of pay attention to what we're doing. The, uh, the, uh, the UGA analysis will start kind of in earnest probably in October of this year. And so we'll be putting that up on the web and we'll be publicizing it through our steering committee of elected officials. So you'll start to see where that analysis is going. Similar to that, Joel. Paul, question with that. And, and we talked with the planning group via the Zoom meetings or whatever, like either it's COVID. Um, and we're not opposed to to the development out there uh, in Rhino Ferry, which is kind of the last open areas on the south of the development. And obviously, it's just that, that type of development. And they, Thing that me and my neighbor, when we talked about it, said, okay, we're not opposed to it. But what do we do with the roads? Because all you have to do is go a mile west to Regal and looking at that, so I hear the capital improvement discussion to how we were making sure Regal wasn't a make sure that it, I mean, we all know it's good there. We can decide or not. It's good. And so we've got Glenbrooks now that she knows. It's very busy. It's unsafe for water to go drive the bicycle. It needs so. What point out there in the planners' minds do you start asking developers to put into a kitty so that there's funds available? Not wait 20 years and then go, hey, we've got to have better roads, and then the traffic is crippled. It's a it's a significant challenge for Spokane County. Uh, we don't currently use an impact fee. Uh, the city is adopting or is thinking of adopting those, especially in the, in the North Grand the neighborhood. Uh, but we don't currently use them. And because of the scale of development that happens here, which is relatively small scale, unlike the, you know, the booming cities in the South, 
a development impact fee for a 20 acre or a 40 acre subdivision isn't going to amount to much. And if it sits there for 20 years, it's not going to be enough to build a road. So we have to think of other funding sources to make that happen. But that's why the capital facilities plan is getting into all of these plans. Uh, development can't go somewhere if it can't be supported by sufficient capital facilities for growth. That right? includes road, water, sewer, uh, fire, and uh, other things. So there's a there's a breaking factor on, on where some development can go. It just can't be accommodated. Regal is a great example. Regal is like the urban version of 195. It, it is a mess, and there's more development growing to the south. That's in, out in the Moran Prairie is going to be a growth area, and so Regal is going to be a challenge for the next 20 years. But the, the point is, uh, there's no magic bullet, but we are tying growth back to capital facilities in a, in a deliberate legal way for probably the first time. So just, just as kind of rural areas get impacted with urban zoning, which is what I thought is happening, right. we're not seeing <laughs> comparability in construction services, sidewalks and bike paths and things that are a half mile away. But yeah, we're being impacted with urban you know, development densities. Land development is and has been a missed business. <laughs> we're trying to get a better organizational plan for us and our future in, in this round. Yes, sir. Sorry, I came late, so I might have missed uh, the answer to my question. But um, one of the segments of Spokane, the region is close to nature. How do you balance? Close in rural areas with basically the sprawl of growth. Because you have to balance, I mean, this gentleman mentioned Glenwood. Glenwood is in a rural area with animals, farms, the whole bit. And yet I know the developers are licking their chops, looking to expand into the Glenwood's area. So, how do you balance keeping that close to nature theme in Spokane with all this development that eventually just be? Urban sprawl over time. Got to have our grandchildren to live in that sprawl. We're uh, we're actually really looking forward to that challenge. <laughs> and part of it is what we said before. the The tool we have today is capital facilities. Thinking. You have to be able to pay for this with that development here. The second thing, and what we hope to explore in the plan and translate in the development regulations, is a new look at zoning so that we're not getting simply a low density residential subdivision of 100 lots on 20 acres of land. But rather, we're starting to say we, we need to be building neighborhoods. We need to be building whole neighborhoods in these places and planning for those neighborhoods so that they're not just row after row after row of street, but then you don't again, you don't have to drive it, you know, in the on the regal to go get groceries. There may there may be small markets, there may be small areas in there. More of mixed uses that almost by definition support slightly higher densities rather than downtown densities, but can take instead of a square mile being accommodated, you might be able to shrink that to a quarter of that land area and accommodate the same amount of population and still preserve some of the open space about it. So there are tools that have been used in other places. We're going to look seriously at that. Well, we're, we're going to outline them for you and for our elected officials and see if there is general support for moving in that direction to, to add a community character element to our land division partners. I'll commend you if you can hold to that line. Because as we all know, we put in so many regulations on certain areas. And all it takes is a developer with deep pockets to come in and eventually that zone is changed to meet their needs as opposed to the needs of the neighborhood. I, uh, I understand your criticism. <laughs> I've been in this business more than 30 years. I'm sure you have. And one thing I've, I've learned both in urban redevelopment and regional planning is if you show this kind of style of development and explain, and, and, the, and the developer has to be at least a little open-minded and say, look, uh, here's a new way of thinking. If you do this, you can probably make more money than you could in your old system. And if you want to do this, you'll get your permits faster because you're meeting our requirements. Mm -hmm. If you want to fight me, you can do that, but it's going to slow you down. Yeah, it, it, you may ultimately win, 
But we think if you do it this way, you actually can come out ahead on your own. Are you referring to mixed use? Essentially, yes. Yeah. Essentially. Thank you. Yes, over here. So how is planning for public transportation coordinated in this process, or is it? Uh, it's it's coordinated sort of peripherally right now. Uh, SDA has a robust planning staff. Uh, their planning director is, is very talented, uh, good friend. And they, they are looking seriously at, at how they do their own route planning. Uh, we've been talking in just in the last few months about how they've got a plan that's going in a you know, 25 to 45 plan. It's like, Carl, can we move it into a 26 to 46? And, and they're like, well, we're too far along. We've got too many grants in here. It's like, okay, got that. But, but let's think about pulling this together in a different way so that as we plan for these developments, uh, if we're looking at something that's going to have more of a, a, a slightly dense center, now, and then somewhere over here, where we can start thinking about how do we link transit to this place over a five or, you know, God forbid, 20 year period, but but put that in place early on so we're not just doing transit planning on route extensions, but actually transit planning to reach areas that should be growing in, in slightly better than you know, sprawled instance. It's, it's an aspirational goal at this point, we're not there yet. Yes, ma'am. You said you were going to try to tie capital facilities to the development of the project. Yes. Who is going to make a list of those capital facilities for that area? Who determines what is going to be tied to that? Uh, essentially, we do. Uh, through both planning, our public works staff, our engineering staff, uh, our public safety staff. We will, we're will. we working more closely with our school districts than we have before. So that those will come in the sense that when uh, when an application comes in, it's reviewed by these agencies and we say, you need this, you need this, you need this, you need this. And then that goes back to them. And if they accept that, that's their contract on how they do it. So is the public allowed to have input into what they see as a missing part of that capital facility? Currently, no, it's an administrative yeah. function. Uh, but it's also driven kind of by engineering and by law. There, there are not a lot of choices in that. The choices for the public are really up front now in the, in the comp plan of setting, you know, what does this area look like? What do we think it should look like? And then, then we can let our technical staff figure out what size bike do you need? How big does the road need to be? And make those things happen. But historically, the, the actual permitting process has not been uh, one where we, where we solicit public comment. We solicit agency comment in addition to ourselves. Well, we have so many areas now where the roads are planned, the county owns the right of way. But the road was never completed. Oh, there's there's uh, probably of thousands of miles of unused right So that's I'm wondering if those will be incorporated as part of this to make the development. No low way to know at this point. Uh, many of those are considered legally abandoned, but it still remain mapped. Uh, some of those date to the 1800s and very early class that were never realized, but they still exist as right away. But we don't we don't have that level of detail in our planning program yet. When it comes down to very specific areas, if we find some of that area, we'll, we'll make recommendations on how to bring it up to modern standards. Yes, sir. You uh, made a comment about moving into areas where there's general support. Do you mean public feedback? Do you mean opposition to grow NIMBY? Uh, is, is that taken into account? It is taken into account. Uh, it is not usually a determining factor because the law tells us where you can and cannot develop. If somebody meets the requirements that are set out in statutes and in our code, then they generally have a right to develop in that area. If we do take public uh, comment into consideration, and that can also help, it can help shape the style or quality of the project. Uh, if, if it's if it's laid out in a very brutal way, we can have some input on how can you soften the edges? How can you better make this better link to the existing neighborhood? How can it better fit with its neighbors? But if there's a, if they meet the legal requirements to, to develop, no, they, they will have that right to develop. So neighborhood opposition doesn't overrule property. So good. Neighborhood opposition is very important in the planning side of it. That's, that's where we have a chance to set what's the character, style, and what is the development going to be in this area. Once that's in place, then we go back and say, how do we implement what that looks like? Right development, right accordingly. 
Yes, sir. Back. Uh, just related to some of these previous questions. Um, I live in country homes, and I, I, I was just curious in light of uh, what you were saying about referring back to the population projections. Um, what is the assumed, for lack of a better word, like carrying capacity of areas that the county overseas that are existing residential or country homes or trailer? Um, because I imagine that as you calculate how much more land needs to be added to UGA or to reserve um, that people are land. So what, what is the assumed density increase possible because it can so what is the assumed density increase of places that currently are just not not in not in a zone residential area if that makes any sense. Sure. The uh, not not area every area is equal of course and, and one of the uh, really most important tools that the county has is its critical areas ordinance. That looks at land and suitability for development, and both on itself and, and in its proximate areas. Uh, and that, that drives uh, how that plan is drawn up. It drives the potential densities for that plan. And it even drives where, in fact, you can build outside of buffer areas. Uh, so the carrying capacity is defined as two things. One is what does the land itself tell us that it can handle, or maybe three. Uh, and then what is the character of the land around it if we're going to develop it in something other than a natural state? Is it is it in truly large lot residential? Is it something that we could create a new neighborhood center? Is it something in between? And the last one is, of course, water and urban services. In parallel with the work we're doing on the comprehensive plan, we're also updating what's called the coordinated water service plan, which is all of the water providers in the county, cities, private, and others, to understand who has water rights, uh, how much do they have, how much can they serve in their own areas, and do they have own, do they have a carrying capacity, in other words, pipes and facilities to actually serve the water that they own. That plan hasn't been updated since 1991. Uh, so we're we're adding that to that for kind of that same reason. We can't accurately or we can't credibly recommend growth in an area if we don't know if it's got water. Very good, very basic. Yeah, and then back here. Do you do you know what services are available everywhere in this planning area? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a little beyond me. Wow. Okay. okay, do you know that we have a water line into our area? Uh, personally, no. But okay. We do, do, do you know? Do you know that we have an engineer and permitted road into the property from Lane Parkway? Okay. You know that. Okay. So, how can I get that message and information to the planners? Uh, I think you just did. We <laughs> can follow up. Well, anyway, so this is really this is we want to we might have to you take notes. So. We again, I told you, we were surrounded by development. We liked our open field, you know, 34 years ago. But I'm really getting tired of maintaining open space for neighbors to throw their garbage, their weeds, their boards, their rocks they find, and then even come and hijack soil. Okay. I'm going to write you a letter that's going to detail all the services we have. And I'd like you to consider it. Of course. Thank you. Yes. I want to be clear that you just said, I think, that if a piece of land has all the capital facilities, fire, water, school, all the rest, and is adjacent to sewer, that and, and they agree that we can have sewer if we take it only even or two ways. Are you saying that if I have all the facilities, I have every right to be in the urban world? That's what uh, I thought I heard you say. Thank no, you. I'd say those are those are conditions you would have to have likely to be considered for the urban growth area. The actual study of the urban growth area is going to be based again on those on what's available, those population areas, and then if uh, additional land is needed to to try to go to areas that are better positioned for it, if they're ready to have full urban services. That piece of land would be a prime candidate. So you're saying it's still not clear that that there are no call there are no guarantees. Thank you. I thought you said something else. Here and that over here. I'm interested in one of the, the new challenges you have uh, as a result of 1181, I think, uh, which is the vehicle mile of travel. 
very simple problem as I see it is you can't reduce vehicle miles travel unless you get more people to do it. That's one so solution. That seems yeah. like something that. Right. Uh, so, what do you do to work with the only transit agency we have, SBA, to help make that possible? Well, part of it, and this is uh, this is more an answer from me as a personal planner than representing the county at this point. Part of it, though, is working with our urban partners. Uh, if if downtown Spokane can get itself into having a really growing urban core of residential living, that's going to take pressure off of some of the development pushing out to the edges. That helps the economics of, of everything, really. The county deals on the edges primarily, so we are limited. We're, we're not going to build high-rise, we're not, we're not going to see high-rise development being built in those areas. Uh, areas like uh, near where Jim is, in that meat area, the North meat area, yeah, that's an urbanizing area. That that could densify a little bit and, and provide areas where people either don't have to drive as far or could even walk doing some things like that. So our goal is, is chiefly to provide uh, more amenities, more services in places that people don't have to go just into the core cities to, to find them. That's an economic argument, but if we, if we put it out as, there's a, a land incentive to do this, and then in that economic development strategy, maybe we could work with a company to say, uh, or they would say, this doesn't pencil out, I can't put a convenience store here. It's like, well, okay, what if you put five of them and serve them out of one central distribution set? Can you do that? Oh, well, they didn't think of that, sure. Now, now you've got a chance to, to put some things in places that are economic that they might not work otherwise. So our, our side is focused not so much on getting people out of vehicles, as is giving them a shorter trip and not to get things they need. Yes, sir. When will the county know how much land she it needs to add? Yeah. Best guess will be by the end of the year. Any estimates at this point? No. So, if it's reasonable to have to do 17% in 12 years, and we would need 17% more land, is that a reasonable way to look at it? Well, it's very simple. Direct way to look at it. Uh, it doesn't quite work that way. Okay, that's why I asked. Uh, then, uh, just to remind me, uh, I'm sure nobody really thinks about this. Uh, the urban growth area, as it exists, has this 15, 1600 acres that are currently zoned rural. Those have to be accounted for in our growth pattern before we can add new acreage to that. What that means is they may move around. We may not have you know, our if hypothetically our urban growth area is 50,000 acres. It may stay at 50,000 acres, but it might not look like that bomb. And the reason for that is the growth area was uh, overestimated from the very beginning, and we we haven't grown into it as much as we thought, and that's chiefly because we put a lot of land around our small towns. Go ahead. Can you just. Uh... You were just discussing Spokane, the city of Spokane capacity and how that impacts your calculations for urban growth expansion. Um, so I guess building opportunities and housing would inflate Spokane's capacity and therefore reduce the county's calculation for urban growth. Is that the true statement? Uh, sort of. If the city, the last time, we went through this exercise in 2016, and the city overestimated what it could absorb in an infill development strategy so pretty significantly. By doing that, though, it cut that number, it, it assigned that number to the city rather than the county or the other cities for growth. And that meant when it kind of ran out of land in certain areas, the city was sort of holding on to this chip. They had recognized that they overshot and they're being very uh, helpful working through this equation right now. But ever since then, they've also adopted more robust uh, or, or more dense strategies for their infill. So they've actually got better tools now than they did 12 years ago for doing infill development. Uh, so they, the city likely can achieve a higher infill than they had in the past. Their challenge, and we've talked about this so they know it, is you can only put, take the South Hill, for example. 
if you're going to scrape a block that has four homes on it and put up a 24 unit project, the land will certainly handle that. You can do good urban design and architecture with your infrastructure support. If the infrastructure was built for 1890s bungalows, if you put up 24 units of contemporary family, you know, even small family housing, it's still used to pipe in the street. So that's another part of the analysis that the city is specifically is looking at in their version. It, you know, it's, it's not something you think about. <clears throat> oh, sure, the land will hold a duplex or fourplex or sixplex, but will the infrastructure actually support? Yeah. Similarly, um, similar to the question, is it is it true that the cost of in, you know, increasing that infrastructure, so to speak, is is lower within the existing UGA that the county has compared to going upwards. Like I think that this top hill is already relatively dense, but like there are areas going up well within the UGA where you could probably I would think increase the infrastructure capacity before you go think about it, going beyond that. If if you can use the existing infrastructure with higher densities, that is far more cost effective than building an infrastructure. If you have to replace urban infrastructure, it is it is almost the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Tearing up, it's, it's one thing to tear up the street in front of those four houses to put 24. Well, that's got to connect to this pipe, and that's got to connect to this pipe. And all of a sudden, you're all the way down to the intersect and running under Post Street Bridge. If, if that's the case, then you're better off building new infrastructure in areas that can support it. Uh, and then back to our goal, that's where we want to see those new areas be a little more like a small neighborhood than rather just, just a row of houses. Anybody else? Thank you very much. For uh, any, anybody online wish to ask a question? Forgive me, I didn't see it on the screen over there. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, if you have something, please raise your hand. Well, we, we will be uh, we'll be back and we'll see you again one of these days. Uh, in the meantime, watch us online. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Well, appreciate you.